Assalamu alaikum, and um, thank you all for joining us. I'm going to try to make this brief. I know a lot of people fear the C word, so I'm going to try to make it not as ugly as people think it is, okay? Okay, so this is going to definitely be a discussion about the challenges and the fight to survive this disease. Let's talk about some key facts here. Uh, as you see, what is cancer? A lot of people don't understand what cancer is. Everybody has the cancer cells in them. The difference is not everybody's cells will mutate. So these are cells that will just, beside genetic factors, and unlike people think, it is mainly because of a genetic factor, it isn't. Genetics is a contributing factor. However, it's just some cells, for unknown reasons, science is still trying to figure them out, um, that decide to mutate. And there are different varying de uh, degrees of mutation, which if you are afflicted with cancer, what you will find out is, uh, beside having grade one, two, three, and four, one being the easiest, four being terminal, um, there is also what is considered the mutation rate. And generally, to give you an idea, a normal cancer cell multiplies anywhere between 15 to 25%. I was diagnosed with stage three. Mine was 80% multiplication rate, so extremely aggressive. Um, with uh, common cancers for men, you will see that uh, for men, lungs, smoking, prostate, colorecticum, stomach, and liver. For women, you get breast, also colorectum, lung, cervix, and stomach. Unfortunately, as time goes on, we're not winning this case with cancer. Right now, the latest statistics that was accumulated worldwide in 2012, there were 14 million cancer cases. But as you see, they're estimating in the next two decades we'll have over 22 million, and most of them are going to be in the developing part of the world. Um, there is about one-third of cancer death, which is due to behavioral and dietary risks. Everybody understands that you're, if you're fat, if you're eating fatty foods and um, basically uh, monosaturated fats, you're basically not helping your health in that end. Uh, people who don't eat enough fruits, vegetables, and low physical activity, tobacco, and alcohol usage. These things are certified. These are not assumptions. These are facts. So if somebody thinks that they just have a, a cigarette every now and then, and it's OK, it's an accumulation factor. You're increasing your risk. If you, I do understand the, the tannins in the, uh, what, you know, the wine, especially the red wine, has been discussed quite widely. Um, Take a, a cup of pomegranate juice, for God's sake. But if you want to uh, increase your cancers of, uh, chances of cancer, keep doing these things. Breast cancer usually occurs to women 50 years and above. The, the cancer rate for women who get struck below 50 is actually only 5%. And like people think, that it's higher. It really isn't. So if you're less than 50 and you get cancer, you're in the 5%. Yay, I was one of them. Breast cancer is the leading cause of death for women, anywhere between 29 and 59. And actually, recently, due to the fact that we're not eating um, organic foods or what is considered organic, the death rate has even gone lower because people are be feeding their children from a very young age unhealthy food. Women with BRCA1 or BRCA2 gene mutation, which are the main determining factors for the genetic code that you have breast cancer in you, have an increased risk of both breast and ovarian cancer. As you know, the example is the famous Angelina Jolie. Now, when you do get tested for BRCA1, BRCA2, if there is multiple cases of that in your family, um, I do need to tell you that is not certified you'll get cancer, and also the fact that you can test negative and still get cancer. Now, granted, the cases of people who can be tested negative BRCA1, BRCA2, and still get cancer is small, but it, it's, it does happen. I'm actually one of them. Now, this is uh, the 2012 overall rate. I just want to show you, especially because we're talking here, North Africa and the Middle East, this is the rate, the lifetime risk between age 15 and 79. The survival rate, as I pointed out there, is exactly the inverse of the chart. So even though in the advanced countries, Western nations, the rate of getting cancer is high, they're going to survive 
their survival rate is actually much higher than ours as we go down. And again, developing nations, poorer education, poorer health services, and so on. All of these are contributing factors. All right, let's go quickly through my situation. Um, Pre-cancer stage. I was an extremely active woman. I was living at that time in Berkeley, California. Um, worked out minimum five times a week, lived next to a lake, jogged every day, ate organic. People who would know people from California, they'll tell you we're kind of hippie people, we're into organic when people didn't know what organic was. Um, never smoked, never drank alcohol, by choice. Um, when I was diagnosed, I was 29, with my first lumps, they were benign, that wasn't cancer, but that was the beginning of my fight. What happened was, one day I came back from a jog and went to the shower, and oops, there was a little bump. That bump wasn't there before. I didn't know what to think. I called my doctor, the GP, who was my GP for over seven years, and he said, come in. He did the initial testing with his hand, the check-in, and he found six lump between both breasts. We waited post the weekend, and I did a mammogram, and they found an additional three. It was a total of nine. We tested a biopsy. They're all benign. So what happened was um, there was no family history, not breast cancer in my family. There isn't. Um, different type of cancers from far off, but not breast cancer in particular, nor ovarian cancer. What the doctors decided was that I'll have to do a three uh, to four month checkup. Uh, so I do ultrasound, and then once a year I had to do a mammogram, 29. I was just getting ready to get married. Cancer stage. Um, all right, what brought my cancer stage around? I have to say it was, um, everything was quiet all these years. Five years ago, suddenly everything took a dive. I started having massive mutations in my cells. Doctors couldn't explain in Dubai what's going on. I started having first one surgery to take one lump, then another surgery to take a few more lumps, and it got to the point where I had three surgeries in a year. And then suddenly, one day, I was told I have cancer. <sighs> what can I say? Um, the doctors decided in that hospital, even though I kept asking them all the time before that, is this going into cancer? And their answer was no. I knew in my gut instinct, and actually my doctor back then at 29, I told him the first thing. I told him, I have a gut feeling about this. He's like, no, 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 no. Where's Gadir, the chirpy person? I'm like, she's still here. But I have a gut feeling about this. I'll wait and see. Let time prove me otherwise. I'll live my life. I'll still take care of me. What happened was they moved me immediately to Tawam, which is in a line. Tawam immediately took these results and decided to do what they do is a double blind test. So they're two laboratories and they need to come back with exact identical results. Both of them, um, to give you an idea, I did a full biopsy of every lump, which is like a hollow needle that goes into the lump, takes a sample, they test that. For each lump, they need about two to three samples. You're wide awake. They only numb that area, so for each lump, each location had to be numbed and the extraction done while I'm awake. And um, not a fun procedure, extremely painful, but what you have to do is just remember they are trying to help you. These doctors are not trying to hurt you. We did that. I did the biopsies on Monday. Uh, the plan was that I'll start what they call the baseline test. They start checking your heart rate, everything, just to see before chemotherapy and all the treatments, you know, what is the progression or lack of in your health. On Wednesday, 5 p.m., I got a call from my doctor. Um, no more joking. We used to banter a lot. She wasn't bantering anymore. And she said to me, tomorrow, 8 a.m., come to the hospital. I was like, no, 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 I, uh, you got that wrong. I have a 10.30 appointment, and this is my first test for my baseline. She's like, did you hear me? 8 o'clock a.m., my office. I remember my mom was here was the core and the rock that really saw me through this. She looked at me, she said, what's going on? And I said, well, we do know it's cancer, but I think we have another surprise. We barely slept, both of us. You can be as strong as you want to be. I would love to meet the person who said they weren't scared. 
We went in, and the doctor wasn't laughing or smiling anymore. She's like, please sit. I was a pre-med student, so she was like, I feel you will understand what I'm going to talk about here. She gave me a copy of my report. Yeah, I had a lovely cancer, stage 3, right up. The spread rate, as I said, 80%. It already invaded my lymph node, and the lymph node is very dangerous because it's like the freeway into your body. When it acts as a lymph node, it spreads like wildfire. So she sat there explaining all this, and she said to me, let me explain this to you. You are going to start your chemo today. Not tomorrow, not next week. It's like, what about the baseline test? She's like, no time. You start now. So you can imagine, I didn't go that day thinking I'm going to have my chemo. Um, not that fast, at least. I, I thought maybe in another couple of weeks. And, um, and these were my options here. Because of the fast spread, they needed to give me the chemo. It was followed by surgery, so I did a double mastectomy and the removal of partial removal of my right node. Thank God they didn't need to remove all of it. Um, and then radiation, I did daily radiation for five weeks. And they obviously had to stop my ovaries because my cancer, the different types of cancer, mine was feeding on estrogen, which is my female hormones. So it's encouraging it to grow more. Um, my biggest supporter, my mom. <laughs> my attitude during treatment. I got asked that question so many times. A lot of people asked me, so did you say to yourself, why me? And I said, you know, it's funny. I never said, why me? My approach in life is the following. God gave us choices. I do know God loves us all. Having said that, what might appear as um, bad or evil to us, if it happens, such a situation, this is a human mentality range. God is a very different range. Who was I to question God? All I knew was this. The doctor said to me before I go into my first chemo, she's like, listen, we're going to give you all the medication that you can need to fight. You need to fight. Medication won't save you. And just keep your faith that things will work out fine. And that's what I did. Where am I now? Alhamdulillah, my last chemo was last year in May. My surgery was the um, September before that. Um, as you, you know, I'm still tired. I do get fatigue. Uh, I still don't have my energy levels back as I would like them to be. Um, I'm sorry. Age and vision, I can't see the monitor, so I'm turning her there every now and then. Uh, hair growing back. Eyebrows, whatever grew back, grew back. What didn't, too bad. Um, eyelashes. Um, I was one of the few patients who unfortunately suffered from osteoporosis where the it's not normal. The chemo itself ate my bones and my ligaments. So I, if you saw me by the third month, I was actually walking like a 90-year-old woman. Um, I literally have difficulty getting up and sitting down or even praying properly. Um, I'm trying to practice Tai Chi. I started Tai Chi trying to just learn how to take control of my life and um, trying to figure out the gym part. Not yet, working on it. Um, now, I get a lot of questions. Are oh, you completely recovered? I had this gentleman walk to me a few months ago, and he's like, khalas, you're done with cancer. And I looked at him, I was like, alhamdulillah, for now. He's like, no, 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 you're done, right? I mean, what's, what's there more? And I looked at him, and I said, if you think a normal person should go every three months, which is the cycle I'm in now, to go and get a confirmation from a doctor, you're still cancer-free, and you think that's normal? I guess I'm normal. I was like, but don't ask me that question again. Um, what has this experience done to me? It has done a lot. As Tiffany has indicated, I view cancer as a school. A lot of us, all of us, I would like to think, get a chance to go to college and get educated. But not all of us graduate or absorb the same amount of information. And not all of us apply that in their life the same way. And cancer school is the same. I'm not unique. There are many cancer patients out there. However, not everybody absorbs the lessons properly or want to do something about it. As a matter of fact, specifically in breast cancer, women tend to shy away. 
and this is not just in the Middle East. This is a global problem. What it has made me do is I'm not blessed with children, and there will be no hope of that now. But what I would like to think is that I'll be able to give back enough and leave a proper legacy behind me of giving back. Challenges I found during the treatment. Well, there is not enough. One, the treatments available for cancer are very limited, and they're not available as widely as we'd like to think. There's a lack of uh, a misunderstanding of the importance of the environment, our psyche. For example, the word in Tawam where I was treated, unfortunately, was painted gray. The curtains, darker gray. And I kept <laughs> talking to the management, could you please give us like a bright color here? Anything, it's just a bright color, for God's sake. You give me a medication and I have to fight internally and you're surrounding me with gray, gray. And just to let you know, I'm not a fan of the color black. I used to be, I would wear black trousers, but anything on the top when I'm looking at your faces, not black. <laughs> um, there was a lot of uh, lack of nutritional, psychological, and um, physiological support to enhance the treatment. They don't, in the hospitals, and, and in, it's in all hospitals, there are very few hospitals around the world that will treat cancer as a holistic approach. So the doctor who took care of my bones didn't really listen to what the doctor for my oncology was doing, was not listening to what my gyno was doing. Each one worked in a silo, created a big problem for me. And this is just not me. At least I'm educated and I can go and, and research. But there are a lot of people who don't have that um, ability. There's a lack of treating patients as a whole, like I said, and supplements. I actually asked one of the doctors, can I take CoQ10? One of the chemos that I get uh, impacted the muscle of my heart. It actually went down from 100% to 70. I'm still here, I'm still alive, working on it. And I said, can I take CoQ10? He said, what is that? I said, if I have to tell you what's CoQ10, I'm concerned, seriously concerned. What a survivor has to put up with and go through, the conceptions and challenges from society, Everybody thinks that you're dying. You just lose that hair, you fluff up a little bit. I was one of the people who looked absolutely horrible, ugly, I looked like a human lizard. Um, I had a blue tongue, and blue nails. But you know what? I couldn't believe how people were more scared from me. When they didn't understand, I was more scared from them due to my immunity. I would literally walk into a mall, like, I have to gauge when it's the lowest time in, in the mall of people around. And what I found was people would see the mask and they literally would leave the aisle away and go away from me. They didn't understand. I was the one who was supposed to do that instead. Um, challenges to keep surviving after the big fight. You, unfortunately, they told us to fight and gave us a medication. Cancer survivors around the world have a problem knowing how to survive post-surviving cancer. They kind of like just strike you off. You survive. They're like, goodbye. And it's something we need to look into. A lot of the people who relapse is because of this. Challenges to push for better drugs and treatment options. We don't incur money. I mean, cancer is a money maker. They don't need to find better treatments. More people dying. Toughest challenge from oneself is to never give up and to monitor your lifestyle. Now, I'll try to rush through the next two slides. Uh, my medical advice, if you have cancer in your family, please go and check BRCA1 and BRCA2 testing, please. There is the GDA center in, located in Dubai, and there is an early screening, uh, pre-screening center all over the Emirates. The number for the one in Abu Dhabi is this. The reason I'm saying that, not every doctor is good, please. All the women here, for all the men who have women in their families, your wives, your sisters, your daughters, mothers, go to these, they're highly specialized. Tumors are not easily detected by everybody. Avoid, obviously, tobacco, if you can, alcohol, excess sugars, especially artificial types, saturated fats, and salt. They just found out in the last two years that high intake of salt is as dangerous as sugar. Have a healthy lifestyle, Try to do sports at least three times a week. Eat healthy foods. Increase your fruit and vegetable intake and try to eat hormone-free uh, meats if you can. Do annual checkups, especially from the age 30 onwards. 
unless, of course, you have an infliction in your family. A lot of women who have breast cancer, ovarian cancer, go earlier. For, um, you know, there's a, a, a personal checkup, try to do that. For women from ages 35 to 40, definitely start doing your, make sure you stick to your annual pap smears and mammograms. Avoid excessive uh, exposure to sun rays. Uh, always have your um, sunscreens on, but definitely avoid the sun between 10 a.m. and 4 p.m. These are the most dangerous light. Do go before and after. You need the sun for vitamin D, and, uh, which helps your cells fight. And avoid stressful triggers. Learn how to calm yourself, negative energy situations. You don't need that. My personal advice from my experience, be true to yourself. If something doesn't make you happy, you're not cuckoo. Stop pleasing other people. If you can't be happy with yourself, you ain't gonna make anybody else happy. Keep negative people away, always. The energy drainers, you know, people who always nag and make the same mistake and want your help, always, always, always. You give the same advice, but we're going in a, a useless circle. Learn positive selfishness. You're no good dead. You need to learn how to love yourself, and that, if, if they call that selfishness, it's a positive selfishness. Learn from this experience, what I call the cancer school, and enjoy this new life. Chase your dreams. You got one life to live. Live it your way, not how somebody else tells you to live it. Don't be a passive patient or a survivor. Learn about this. Don't fear it. Embrace it. Always be thankful. We take for granted the life, the air that we breathe, the ability that we can walk around. When I was not able to just get up and every bone in me was hurting, still does, but not as bad, you learn how to be thankful for everything. <sighs> Definitely always believe in yourself. Don't let anybody tell you you're not complete. We live in a society, I was asked earlier by um, one of the journalists here. She said, what do you think is the problem with breast cancer? I said, this society. We've come into a society where women are judged by outer beauty only. We're not humans, and especially boobs. God knows, the larger the better. That's not true. And if you don't have them, it doesn't make you less of a woman. Don't let anybody judge you because of your boobs. <laughs> And for, like I said, I call the breast cancer angels. You're not defined by breasts or lack of them. Always let people who you care about know that you love them. It's gonna come a day, not because of cancer, but because of just life. You won't have the chance to tell them you love them and care about them. So please, don't, don't live in a silo. A hidden but a sad fact. And this is, again, a global thing. A high percentage of the women who get afflicted with cancer, and especially breast cancer, because this is the particular disease that attacks a part of our body that identifies us as women. They get mistreated, abandoned, divorced in the cultures where they can have a second, third, fourth wife, other marriages. And that's really sad. Because that's not true otherwise when we reverse the situation. So there is a message for men. There is a new global movement. Please support it. Please. It's called Him for Her. And my mantra, which I created, I'd like to think everybody creates a mantra that they believe in. It's the message that you need to enforce every day and tell yourself. And this is mine. And still I rise like a phoenix from the ashes, burning and bright. Thank you all.